What is your message to voters in these final weeks? Well, first of all, early voting for the state ballot starts May 16th through the 20th. Only one week of early voting and then May 24th is the big day. There is a lot of ballot confusion out there. Important issues, Jack, two constitutional amendments dealing with property tax and also local elections, but that is a separate ballot that concludes this Saturday on the 7th. But I'm asking registered Republican voters to go out there, make sure that we restore honor and integrity to our top cop position in Texas. Uh, we have a, a top attorney, regretfully, that is facing three felony counts in Houston and also an FBI investigation looking into bribery corruption. So we need to hit the reset button, clear the slate, make sure that we beat the Democrats and go with somebody that's going to follow the Constitution and follow the law here in our state. What are your other top priorities? First is securing the border, uh, first and foremost. When I talk to everyday Texans, it doesn't matter, even though we're visiting in North Texas, regardless of where you are, that is the number one issue. And, and look, I'm the son of a legal immigrant. I've seen the process done the right and responsible way, and we need to uphold that and celebrate that in our country. But right now, the national policy is such that we have an open door to anybody who's willing to come to our, our country. And it's dangerous, it's lawless. We see children um, not only abducted, but women raped on the border. We see a massive amount of fentanyl and narcotics being smuggled across. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why I've, I've obtained a lot of law enforcement endorsements in this race, namely the National Border Patrol Union, because they know I'm going to be tough uh, from a law and order perspective under state criminal trespassing law to for deploy a mobile prosecution unit to help the governor's effort with National Guard troops and also uh, DPS troopers that are doing what they possibly can. But regretfully, Ken Paxton is trying to stay out of jail and has not deployed any legal resources to help our county DAs and sheriffs do their job on our southern border. Well, the state is spending $4 billion uh, to help with that effort. So what do you say to that? I mean, the money is being spent by Texas taxpayers. Money is being spent and allocated by the legislature, which I support, but that is for law enforcement itself, to arrest, apprehend, and detain. My criticism of Ken is that he has not helped with the legal resources to actually prosecute these claims. So in many instances, many of the illegals that are being detained under criminal trespassing claims in southern county areas are now being released just like the federal government is doing with the notice to appear program for those seeking to obtain asylum. So my my proposal, and I'm the only candidate in this race that has traveled the entirety of the border, is to forward deploy legal resources not only to prosecute state criminal trespassing claims, which are not being adequately addressed because a lot of county DAs have minimal staff, but also to work with private ranchers and farmers to draft easement to construct Texas Wall, much like what I've already done as land commissioner building Texas Wall on state acreage. So you're saying that's lacking, and because that's lacking, these uh, folks who were detained are being released because of that? They are, because under Supreme Court jurisprudence, we can't indefinitely hold criminal defendants, whether they're legal U.S. citizens or illegal immigrants. And so, in many cases, a lot of the DA offices have to release and sheriffs have to release illegal immigrants that initially were arrested for criminal trespassing or property claims. Jack, it's also an issue relating to drugs, and we're seeing even in suburban areas here in the Metroplex of, of children ingesting the toxic cocktail fentanyl, which is now studied by the CDC to show that this is the largest cause of death among 18 to 45 year olds. And so for some reason we've gotten soft on criminal sentencing for narco traffickers. We're not placing more of the blame on bloody drug cartels that are perpetrating this crime. And that's part of the reason why last week I put out a press statement that you may have seen that asserts the state of Texas sovereignty because under the U.S. Constitution, the national government has a duty and a responsibility to protect the individual states like Texas. I was going to ask you about that. Basically, you are wanting the state to declare an invasion. So talk to me about that. How, how does that work? Who declares that? So under Article 4, Section 4 of the U.S. Constitution, the national government has a duty to protect the states. And under Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution, the states have the ability to assert their own sovereignty. So the first step in the process is for the Attorney General of a respective state to declare an invasion. The Attorney General over in Arizona, Mark Bronovich, was the first to present this legal theory to say that it's border drug cartels 
that are essentially the invaders that are perpetrating crimes in southern border areas in order to transit human beings but also narcotics. Uh, the governor in that state has chosen not to invoke his authorities under the state constitution to start enforcing federal immigration law. Um, I put out my press statement stating that, in being very transparent with the people of Texas, that as Attorney General I would have declared sovereignty months ago knowing that this administration was not going to construct another inch of wall or now chip away at the Trump administration policies, namely the Remain in Mexico policy uh, uh, as well as Title 42. So now that that announcement has been made that the Biden administration will lift Title 42, that's why I said this is the time to assert our state's sovereignty. Ken Paxton has not. Um, I believe that this is a, a, a challenge for um, all Americans, not just the state of Texas, but knowing that this will be the national policy for the next few years, Texas legally should assert its own authorities and present the governor that option to invoke. But going back to the U.S. Constitution for a minute, weren't the framers really talking about organized armies from foreign governments? We're not talking about that here, right? So is that really going to hold up water in court? Well, there is prior case law that confirms what you say, that uh, not only state actors were contemplated, but also non-state actors. And Arizona, in a case known as U.S. versus Arizona, challenged that theory, saying that illegal immigrants um, themselves constitute an invasion. The Supreme Court disagreed um, at the time, and so that is the current law of the land. Mark Bronovich's advisory opinion in Arizona is slightly different in saying that it's never been tested that cartels and organized transnational gangs that are known to transit narcotics and humans and profiting from this trade um, are the ones that are the actual invaders. And so as attorney general, I would try to find standing under that legal theory and bring that case to the federal court system to challenge that doctrine, to say that the term invasion can apply to non-state actors, in this case, bloody drug cartels that are sophisticated, that they're, they're organized, in many cases control a lot of the operational areas in and around uh, the border areas. And look, that's what I bring to the table differently from Ken. I've served in the military. I drilled right down the street here in Fort Worth at NASJRB and the Southern Command and looked and, and took on the challenges of transnational gangs, including MS-13, and the challenges that they present to our honorable law enforcement here in Texas. So walk me through this. Let's, for argument's sake, say, okay, an invasion has been declared by the state of Texas. Then what? What, what power does that, what authority does that give you, and what would you do if you had it? The governor would then have the statutory authority as the commander-in-chief of our National Guardsmen to now be able to enforce federal immigration law. Uh, that is constantly the problem that we face uh, when talking with Border Patrol officials and even ICE officials that have challenges and differences of opinion with Secretary Mayorkas, who through a variety of internal memos have stated do not arrest and detain illegal immigrants in, unless it's incident to another violent crime that is committed. Uh, so even though federal immigration law is very clear in terms of, uh, of the asylum process, in terms of folks that can apply for U.S. citizenship, a lot of officials internally can't observe what the law says because of internal memos from their own secretary of DHS. And that's the fr frustration that a lot of these officials have. And so to answer your question, the governor would invoke and the governor announced after my announcement that he's taking a deeper look at invoking that authority. He's concerned about the liability potential for local law enforcement, DPS troopers and National Guardsmen if they did turn back um, asylees and illegal immigrants that were detained in, under state auspices because we don't want to expose our law enforcement officials to uh, criminal liability under federal law. So, but the role that I would take as Attorney General is giving, that gov giving the governor the option to invoke that authority, much like what the Attorney General in Arizona did, so that he has more tools in his toolbox to deter what is now the largest surge of illegal immigration. And look, whether it's me or whether it's the governor, we swear to uphold the laws of this country, of the state, and of the Constitution. And we're going to both do everything in our power to make sure that we're upholding these documents. Speaking of the Constitution, uh, this week a lot of news. You were up in D.C. and at the uh, U.S. Supreme Court uh, the morning after this uh, draft majority opinion uh, written by Justice Alito was leaked. 
and published in the Politico. And so I'm wondering, uh, explain to us your thoughts about the leak and where are you on what was written by Justice Alito? Well, at the outset, as a former judicial clerk myself, I worked in the federal court system with uh, Judge Fitzwater over in Dallas. It's a breach, uh, not only, I believe, of the Hatch Act, but of the uh, cone of silence that exists between a judicial clerk and the judges that they work for, where you're supposed to be officers of the court and maintain confidentiality and silence, particularly on, we could argue, the most important case in a generation on the issue of abortion, where there are definite divides and passion on this issue. As it relates to the draft opinion, and, and nothing is official until it's ordered by the court, which is expected in June, and Chief Justice Roberts, I think, is doing the right thing by invoking the FBI to look very seriously at, uh, at this crime, because I believe it is a, a crime, that the opinion is consistent with what most constitutional conservatives have always said about Roe v. Wade, that it was inappropriately decided, mainly because it's not the role of Article III uh, powers for our judiciary to decide social questions such as abortion and other questions that come before the court, that it is best decided by the will of the people that is reflected and expressed through its state legislature. And so New York, California have trigger laws that say that they will permit abortion all the way to full term. Texas, uh, which I happen to agree with, uh, and I believe it's now 23 states that have similar trigger laws that will ban abortion outright. And as Attorney General, I will defend the trigger law. Uh, I've always believed as a constitutional conservative that this issue should be resolved at the state level, not at the national level, um, and that under the 14th Amendment, that the due process uh, clause does not create a constitutional right. And, and Justice Alito presented that in his opinion by saying that at the time in 1868, there were no states that legalized abortion. Virtually all states criminalized uh, abortion. And as a textualist, as an originalist, I believe you have to look at the original intent of the framers in terms of how that amendment was drafted at the time. How concerned are you, if at all, about a poll that came out uh, by the Texas Politics Project uh, surveying Texans last month, and 54% of the people oppose the idea of what's in the trigger law, which is banning all abortions in Texas if Roe versus Wade is overturned. So how concerned are you about this poll showing a majority say they disagree with that? Leadership is about um, taking the position that you feel is right. And in this case, as the lead attorney for the state of Texas, I'm gonna follow the Constitution, unlike my opponent, who not only violates state law, federal law, but ignores the U.S. Constitution, whether it was his election integrity suit to try to get a federal preemptive pardon. I'm going to focus on what I believe the Constitution embodies. And in this case, I believe that the state of Texas, through its legislature, should make the decision on abortion. And I will defend every law that comes out of the legislature feverishly, fervently, in all court systems that, that it permits it. So I'm willing to take the political price for that. I happen to agree with the trigger law, I've fought for life. And the Democrat on the other side of this race, by the way, Jack, is uh, about as more extreme as you'll find on the pro-choice side of things that I think will equally turn off um, maybe more so, more so uh, voters out there that are thinking in the general election about who they're gonna elect as the next attorney general. Let's uh, continue on the polls. Uh, your polls uh, haven't been great, honestly. Uh, you know that, you've seen them. Uh, the Texas Policy Project poll that just came out show your favorability rating, you're underwater. 28% uh, favorable, 35% unfavorable. Uh, people are 21% neither way. And then there was the Texas uh, Policy, uh, Hispanic Policy Foundation poll that showed you were behind 65 to 23% against uh, General Paxton. What do you make of these polls? They're not good. Well, I'm not a pollster, um, and like I shared with you during the regular primary, the most important poll is an actual election day. And on March 1, I know this, that 58% of Republicans went against Ken Paxton, saying that they wanted uh, to remove corruption from one of the highest offices in our land. So I'm consistently reaching out to Justice Guzman, Congressman Gohmert supporters. Anecdotally, I can share with you every day that we're winning over hearts and minds throughout Texas. 
As I mentioned at the outset, this is going to be a very low voting turnout race. My people are really inspired throughout the state. And a lot of conservatives that are undecided say, where's Ken Paxton? We all know that he's out on criminal bond, but we didn't know he was under the witness protection program because I've challenged him to 10 televised debates, five televised, five in front of grassroots conservatives. He hasn't accepted one invitation. And Jack, if you're able to get him out, let's have a debate. I think you should moderate it. And I would welcome that. Any day of the week, I will show up. We only have 18 days left before this race. And the reason is because he doesn't want to be asked the tough questions. He thinks that he's entitled to this. He's been in politics for over 22 years. And so when I talk to Texans every day, they're, they're opening their minds to the idea that we need to have an advocate that's above approach, a conservative, but is not generating controversies and clouds of legal suspicion endlessly, which affects job performance, but also jeopardizes the, the rest of the Republican ticket that down ballot will be negatively affected with Beto O'Rourke raising lots of money, Rochelle Garza, who's popular on the other side of the aisle, and Ken Paxton will lose to the, I guarantee that he'll be perp walked once again for bribery corruption charges this time around, and Republicans can't take that risk. Based on these polls though, don't you think that's kind of baked in where people have heard your comments, they heard the other candidates in the race, um, you know, leading up to the March 1st primary. And so they've heard it, they've considered it, and you know, at this point, they may be good with it. I mean, what do you make of that? Well, the poll also did not ask anybody if they actually voted in the March 1 primary. So that, that's a big uh, a red flag for anybody that follows politics. And with the low voting turnout, most pollsters will tell you it would be criminally negligent to charge campaigns or news organizations to poll in such a low voting turnout race. And so I'm not exaggerating in saying that every voter interaction is an opportunity to win this race because we expect only 300,000 plus Texans to vote in a state of 30 million people. I mean, think about that, Jack. One of 100 Texans will have a voice as to who their next top cop is. So that's why I'm running a grassroots retail campaign, a very micro-targeted effort. The endorsements I'm picking up, the energy, the enthusiasm is there. I've just picked up the Texas State Firefighters Association, so all 19,000 firemen and women around our state are going to be block walking and phone banking for me. So in the end, people are going to choose honor and integrity and public service oriented leadership over criminality, corruption, and an endless uh, legal suspicion. George P. Bush, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Let's set up the debate, Jack. Let's do it. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Jack. All right.